you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Colossians. It's in the New Testament. Colossians chapter 1, we're going to read verses 15 through 20. And when I say we're going to read, I mean we're going to read. The scripture is also on the screen behind me. So I want to invite you to stand as we read from the gospel, if you will, according to Paul in his letter to the church at Colossae. All together. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Amen. Glory to God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Will you pray with me? Lord, we are thankful for this, your word, and we're thankful for your presence in this place. And as we continue together this morning, As we sit at your feet, as we worship around your throne, would you bless us with your presence, shore up our identity in you, position us for the scattering and all the places that we go that we might be faithful in who you've called us to be, faithful in how you've called us to live. Come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, pray that with me. Come Holy Spirit, amen. I grew up in a church where we talked about God and Jesus, or we referred to the Trinity as God, Son, and Holy Spirit, without ever acknowledging the Father in either place. And I know on the one hand it's semantics, but on the other hand it's really very important. Ours is a triune God. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. Each person of the Trinity is uniquely distinct. And so we say week in and week out, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of all things and of all people. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, Savior of the world, rescue He rescued us. He reconciled us to God's own holy self. He set us free for living life in this world. I believe in the Holy Spirit, which is the presence of God in the hearts of those who believe, those who receive this gift of salvation. The Holy Spirit's role and goal is the ongoing work of salvation, of sanctification. God is Father. God is Son. God is Holy Spirit. And the Trinity is at once uniquely distinct and altogether one true God, apostolic and universal. This morning, as we've already said, liturgically speaking, it is Christ the King Sunday, and our focus is on God the Son. Jesus Christ, who is Lord and leader of our lives. And I love that understanding of what does it mean that Jesus is Lord? It means he's the leader. And so we follow him and his way of living. The liturgical calendar provides a framework for us to understand the whole of God's salvation story and the role of God, his character, his ways, and our being written into it, our participation in it, provides a framework for the declaration of God's gracious provision of full salvation, which is made possible to us through the person and work of Jesus Christ, who is Lord over all. He is our coming King. And next Sunday, we begin a new year, if you will, the first Sunday of Advent. So it's almost like New Year's Eve is approaching as far as goes being Christians. We are 
We will be preparing to celebrate the birth of Christ who came once, but you know he's coming back. And you know that he comes repeatedly through word and spirit, and we get to live into and realize that as reality of our lives. That's what today is all about. As we remember Christ our King in full anticipation of his ultimate rule and reign. And as I looked at and studied the scripture that we read this week, just a moment ago, there were two thoughts that emerged from that passage, and the first refers to Christ's relationship to this created world, all that he made. The second refers to Christ's redemption of what he created. And so, what is Christ's relationship to the created world? It's hard for us to put our faith in something we can't see. And yet we do it over and over again. We believe in music, even when we can't see how it's made or where it's coming from. You know it moves us on the inside. It does something to our experience. Or think about the foulest odor you've ever smelled. You may not know where it's coming from, but there's no doubt the gag reflex that's conjured up. And those may be weak examples, but what about the wind? We cannot see it, don't know where it's coming from or where it's going, but we feel its effects and we see its impact on things that are around us. When this world was in the dark about who God is, God stepped down out of heaven in the person and work of Jesus. And when we were in the dark about who Jesus is, God gave us his word. Jesus is the word made flesh, the image of the invisible God. And over the course of time, God has been meeting his people right where they were from the very beginning, giving them revelation that was perfect for where they are, enough to move them along so that they could take on and take in more of who God was. And that's the process that we experience in the living of our lives. We learn about ourselves. We learn more about who God is. We submit and surrender all things. Jesus, firstborn over all creation. And it's not that Jesus was born first, way back there in the beginning. Jesus has always been. Firstborn does not refer to time but to place or status. Jesus is over this created world and he is superior to every person, place, or thing that's been created because he was with God in the beginning. He's always been, and it may not have been in the human flesh. It sure wasn't dear Lord, baby Jesus, but he was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made, and without him, nothing was made that has been made. In Christ, all things were created, material and spiritual. Sun, moon, stars, mountains, bodies of water, earth, wind, and fire, marriage, the church, family and friends, angels, demons, heaven, hell. If you can dream it, if you can see it, if you can taste, smell, or feel it, Jesus is behind it all, and contrary to science or philosophy, God and the universe are not at odds. God's kingdom, God's creation, it all belongs to Jesus. And in Christ, all things find their ultimate fulfillment. Whenever I'm counseling couples before marriage, there is a time when I get up on my soapbox and talk about how it is possible to have a great marriage without Christ. We see plenty of them in this world, but things could be so much better, more fulfilling. It's possible to have a good life, a great work and home balance, and to be everything it could be so much more if Christ was at the center of it all because in him all things find their existence and their fulfillment, ultimate purpose even. That's the relationship that Jesus has with his created order, this world that he has made. So what about the redemption of all that he has created? It is Christ in whom and through whom we have redemption. Hebrews 2.10 affirms this. 
God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory, and it was only right and fitting that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader, fit to bring them into their salvation. That's the New Living Translation. Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the end, the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness, all his fullness dwell in him. One of my heroes in the faith is E. Stanley Jones, who was a missionary to India, contemporary with Mahatma Gandhi. He was a Methodist elder, an elder in the Methodist church, and was voted bishop of Methodist Episcopal Church South. But he turned that down because he's not about the institution, but about God's call and heart for the world. Not that it can't be expressed through the church, but he was called to go and be a missionary to India, and he said, when I think of goodness, I do not add virtue to virtue. I think of Jesus of Nazareth. And when I think of God, I do not go through my imagination. I go through his image. He is the express image of God's person. And if God is Christ-like, I could think of nothing higher. If God isn't Christ-like, I would lose interest in him and turn my love and loyalty to Christ alone. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ and through him, through Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself, not just some things, not just American things or things that are of the West, All things, whether things on earth, things even in the heavens, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Marvin Church, Jesus is first. He's the firstborn over all creation, first in order of magnitude, and he is so because he is the center of everything. And that's what he wants to be in your life and in mine. Because the thing that's at the center of your life is the thing that is ultimate in your life, first. So is Jesus first in your life? Is he ultimate, first in importance, the center of everything? I've got a friend named Tammy who graduated from Asbury Seminary in 1998. And she wasn't sure what was next for her, so she went on a short-term mission trip to India. And when she stepped off of that plane there in India, she said, God, give me your heart for India. To which she heard God say, how can I give you my heart for India when you don't even know my heart for you? Now, she had a radical conversion in college, went to seminary, a clean slate, was willing to go and be and do anything, but wasn't sure what the next step was. So went on this short-term trip to figure some things out and even wasn't feeling it when she got on the ground in India. Lord, give me your heart for India. Tammy, how can I give you my heart for India when you don't even know my heart for you? And for the next three weeks, she would tell you she was at spiritual boot camp being broken down, torn down, ripped down in Jesus' name for his good and to his glory. And upon returning to the States, she was so moved that she built a team of donors and prayer support, and she went back to India for the better part of 20 years of her life where she started an orphanage to street kids off the street, and they experienced things that we only read about in Scripture. As she was back in the States sharing stories on furlough, raising support, she was asked, why don't we see things like that here in the States? Why don't we see God move like he did in Scripture? And Tammy said, those kids don't have anything. They are desperate for God, because if he doesn't show up, their history, 
And here we are in the West in the United States, pulling our faith up by our bootstraps, so self-sufficient, don't need anybody, anytime, anything at all, until we do. And then we call out to God for help. He wants to be so much more in our lives. Center of it all, first of primary importance in our lives. And so how does this play itself out on Christ the King Sunday at this point in the Christian calendar? In a number of words, faithfulness. Our loyalty to God. Our allegiance to Christ. And those things are hard and they are challenged all the time. Reflect over the recent weeks of our own experience. The balance of power is shifting in Congress. New speakers and majority leaders are being named. Even candidates putting their name already in the hat for president, to which many in the room are divided on either side of the aisle. And the reality is, there is not one candidate who aligns with scripture on every issue, whether politically or even personally, and even greater, we cannot, you cannot legislate morality. It's too diverse, too broad, this world is too ugly. Yet at face value, or at least on Facebook value, it often looks like our allegiance is to country or political party more than it is to Christ. And I want you to know how grateful I am for this country. So grateful that we have the freedoms that we enjoy, and I'm not telling you how to vote or which political party you should align yourself with, but I am saying Jesus is not a political figure. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, Savior of the world. Let's keep going, because this past year, we made a weighty decision as a congregation to disaffiliate with the United Methodist Church and affiliate with the Global Methodist Church, and there are several reasons we entered into discernment, and at the end of the day, some people were overjoyed and some heartbroken, and most all maintained dignity and respect. Some people have left this church. Others have come to us. And I want to remind you in love and all humility that no matter the politic, whether national or denominational, it's all about Jesus. And I'm constantly drawn, at least in these last few months, to the end of chapter five of the Old Testament book of Joshua. The Israelites are on the verge of entering into the promised land, something that was given to them, but they were going to have to physically fight for. And Joshua is there going over his game plan. They're on the verge of taking Jericho when he looks up because this angelic being, he's not sure what it is, standing before him. And Joshua asks, are you for us or are you against us? Because his mom didn't raise no dummy. <laughs> and if he is for us, we got nothing to worry about. But if he's against us, are you for us or are you against us? Neither. But as commander of the Lord's army, I have now come. And in the words of Dr. Tony Evans, I didn't come to take sides. I came to take over. Incidentally, Joshua's name, the Hebrew translation means the Lord saves. And he does so in very uncharacteristic ways. And he demands our allegiance, our faithfulness, our loyalty, everything that we have. This world is so messy. It is broken and there is so much pain even in the room. We are in desperate need of a savior. And so the question is, especially we who claim his name, where does your allegiance lie? What is your faithfulness look like day in and day out as we gather, as we scatter? God is inviting us to trust him in all of life, to work and live and have our being as unto the Lord, striving hard to make this world a better place. It is Christ the King Sunday, not about politics, not about institution. 
Jesus wants to know, does he have your heart? And if he does, I want you to hear these words of comfort, these words of promise. I will be with you always. He didn't come to give us a life of ease. Some in the room struggling with a recent diagnosis, how they're gonna make ends meet, reconciliation on the verge of family destruction, heartbreak, and not just outside, inside. Jesus didn't promise a life of ease. He didn't come to make life better. Jesus came and said, I am better than life itself. And he wants us to put our trust, our loyalty, our allegiance in him, resting assured in the fullness of his promise to be with us, to be in us, to be near us. We can take that with us all our days. And so on Christ the King Sunday, it's appropriate for us to again take an inventory of our life, of our journey with Christ, of our faith, and discern, God, where are you? Where am I? Do I know your heart for me so that I can have your heart for the world? Will you pray with me? Lord God, we love you and we trust you and we are desperate for you to show up and move in our lives. And we want so badly, we want so badly for you to intervene in our circumstance and in things that are external. Would you intervene on things that are internal? Would you show us your heart for us and move us to overjoy hearts that are on fire, faithful and loyal to you? God, we give you our love, we give you our allegiance, and we pray that you would lead us into the future. Lead us into these next few moments. Come Holy Spirit, move on your church. In Jesus' name we pray.